I've, I think I'm, I'm going to start. It's 9 a.m. here in France. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. You, the sound is good. Um, I want to thank you all to be here. Uh, uh, I hope you are still awake. Uh, you are awake enough, or depending of your time zone and uh, depending of uh, how many hours you attend already at uh, this summit. Uh, I hope you are going to enjoy uh, this uh, one hour session. Uh, I'm really um, glad to have the opportunity to talk about uh, LabVIEW events uh, now. Uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, three people here uh, that have uh, reviewed part of my presentation or the, the whole presentation. Uh, Fabiola, uh, Cyril, uh, and uh, Greg Smith from uh, NIRND. Uh, it was uh, really great to have your inputs. Uh, I learned things. I, I'm still learning things on events, so uh, I hope you will uh, learn things to uh, at least one or two thing, uh, things uh, here. So just uh, before diving into the presentation I, I just want to introduce myself um, quickly my name is Olivier Jourdan uh, I'm a LabVIEW architect uh, I'm a LabVIEW champion I'm from France I think you hear that uh, and uh, I started my uh, own company three years ago uh, I've been using LabVIEW for more than 20 years now uh, Actually, I started using it uh, in the last century. Uh, uh, and uh, um, I started the Overlab three years ago. Uh, we are uh, an I partner, uh, the QMH Trusted Advisor, and we are here to help uh, everyone that have uh, needs uh, with uh, LabVIEW uh, programmation. We can design, uh, develop uh, LabVIEW application. We can help uh, LabVIEW developer or team of LabVIEW developer to uh, improve their, um, their skills, uh, to help them uh, use uh, tools uh, like uh, Git or continuous integration. Uh, we have um, training courses about how to use Git uh, in LabVIEW environment. Uh, how to set up a continuous integration process and also how to uh, master the QMH um, framework. So, uh, yeah, as far as it's related to LabVIEW, we can help. Um, I'm also part of the uh, board of the DQMatch consortium. So this is the, the new company that is uh, responsible of maintaining and improving the uh, DQMH framework. And that's uh, really a, a great uh, uh, journey uh, to be a part of this uh, consortium. So uh, that being said, um, I want to show you 10 things to know or more. Uh, about LabVIEW events. And uh, uh, I don't have any slides uh, today. Uh, it's just uh, LabVIEW examples. So let's get started. Um, first thing I want to uh, show you, and we are going probably to uh, start with really basic things and dive into uh, more advanced uh, things uh, after, but where uh, events can uh, come from uh, in LabVIEW. The first thing, and I think everyone knows uh, that uh, here, and this is the, the first thing you, uh, you use when you start using events in LabVIEW, is the uh, event uh, coming from the uh, user interface. So. It's really easy to uh, handle an uh, event like value change uh, on a button. You can 
uh, handle the mouse, mouse move uh, event to get the, the mouse position. You can handle the keyboard event, et cetera, et cetera. It's all happening in the event structure and you add a new case to handle the new kind of event you want to handle. This is really easy. Another way to have events uh, in LabVIEW, it's the event user, um, the user event. Uh, so basically, it's just uh, firing events programmatically. So you need to uh, create an event. So in this example, I'm creating an event at the beginning of the uh, the code. I'm registering this event uh, here, and then uh, with the the dynamic uh, event node, I can uh, tell this event structure to handle uh, these two uh, new events. And in the bottom loop, I'm generating events, and in the top loop, uh, I'm handling the events uh, with the event structure. At the end of the execution, I'm unregistering the event uh, and I'm um, destroying the user event uh, created at the beginning. So this is uh, a good way to share data uh, between the different parts of your code. I think this are the most known way to have uh, events uh, and to use events uh, in LabVIEW. There are other ways to use events in LabVIEW. Uh, the event callback. Uh, this is probably something not really known, um, but you have this um, register event callback node here. And this is something that could be really interesting to use when you are um, uh, making some uh, UI uh, and you want to avoid uh, code duplication. So how it works. Uh, here you can see that I have no event structure in this code, but I have this register event callback node uh, and uh, I linked to this uh, register event callback a VI, uh, the reference of the VI. And I have this uh, static uh, VI uh, reference and I'm handling the key down uh, event on the uh, VI uh, pane. I can handle any kind of uh, event related to the, the VI. I can link any reference to any control here. And anytime a key down event is going to be uh, fired, this VI is going to be called. In this example, it's just uh, recording the character typed on the keyboard in a file. So if I run the example, and I'm hitting some key on my keyboard, uh, I can find now a new uh, file uh, on the desktop with the key I hit. Um, this is really useful uh, if you make this part of code a sub-VI. You can drop the sub-VI in any other VI to get the feature uh, embedded in your uh, in your code, so that's a great solution to uh, make feature available in any part of your code without rewriting all the code uh, at each uh, time. Last source of events: uh, mix events. Uh, here in my code, I'm handling the acquisition of data uh, through uh, task events. So you can uh, register for event with a task. And here 
I'm coding the read, the Dakimix read uh, on an event uh, handling. Uh, and I call the read uh, each time I have at least 500 uh, samples acquired into the buffer. There are other uh, kind of events available with uh, Dakimix task, but uh, it could be really interesting sometime to have this uh, uh, way to, to, to be aware of what is happening uh, with your task. There are also a uh, way to have events with uh, .NET and ActiveX. I don't have examples here, but yeah, it's good to know that too. Um, Olivier? Any questions? Quick question. Yeah. Yes. Um, Java asked if we will share the project after the presentation. Yes. The it, will, it will be available uh, through GitLab. So I, I will uh, share the, the link at the, at the end of the, the presentation. Thank Good you. question. <laughs> um, speaking of UI events, uh, a thing that should be mentioned here uh, is the filtered event. Um, you probably uh, may notice that uh, if you are, uh, this is something I think it, it's known, but uh, it's always good to remember this, that uh, sometimes you can see uh, events duplicated, kind of. Uh, duplicated events uh, in the um, edit events uh, window. Uh, here we have the key done and the key done, but with a question mark at the end. And uh, the arrow is green for uh, one and red for, for the user. Uh, this is when you have the, the question mark at the end of the, the event. This is a filtered event. So what it means? It means that this event is fired before the uh, action uh, linked to the event is done. So you can modify the event or discard it. So if we run the example, um, here I have um, um, a string control where I can uh, write things and uh, I'm just uh, displaying the last key pressed and now I'm going to discard the key done event. So I'm hitting the keyboard. You can see that last key pressed change, but in the input, as far as I discard the, the event, nothing is happening. The second thing I can do with filter events, it's modifying the event. So here, if I modify the event, you can see that I'm just incrementing the character, uh, the car uh, numeric ascent. So if I'm hitting A in the input, I have B uh, written. And if I hit B, I have C, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the most uh, used case for this filtered event, it's probably um, using the, the close button to stop your uh, VI execution. And I'm going to close the window. The window is not, is not closed, but uh, the code uh, is stopped because I'm uh, asking the while loop to stop, but I discard the close window event, so I can avoid uh, adding a stop um, button on my user interface and simply use this uh, when, uh, uh, when I want to stop the, the code. Now, uh, I want to dive on a topic really, really uh, important. Uh, this is the memory management because when we talk about events, um, uh, there are uh, some people that are uh, concerned uh, about uh, how the memory uh, is managed 
Um, and I, I, I need to show you uh, how the memory management works uh, with events. So here, uh, I have um, a code uh, below the example that uh, is monitoring the, the memory, uh, Windows memory. So uh, I'm going to continuously um, monitor the, the memory in the left graph. And in the right graph, you just have the, the data. It's just to see uh, what is happening. So I'm starting the, this VI. Uh, and uh, yes, we can see that uh, the memory uh, is uh, about uh, zero. This is a, a delta. Um, so what I'm doing in, in this example, I'm starting by creating a user event. And then I'm adding 100 user events with large data, a large amount of data here. As you can see in the memory uh, graph, nothing is happening. So we have uh, messages uh that weights half a megabyte and we have nothing because we didn't register the user event now i'm going to register the event and generate again 100 user events so we can see that the memory is increasing and now i'm going to uh handle this event i'm going to handle half of the 100 um, uh, messages. So you can see that we still have uh, things in memory, about half the, the memory. And now I'm going to uh, unregister for event. And as soon as I'm unregistering the event, the memory goes uh, down. Um, so. If you don't have any register event, you can generate event. It's not a problem with memory. It's not going to uh, create a memory leak. As soon as you are uh, handling the event fast enough, uh, you are uh, removing uh, event from memory. And when you un unregister the event, you are going to free all the memory with all the unhandled event that's the basic way memory uh, is managed with events another example in the uh, memory management and another question another concern uh, people can have uh, with uh, memory usage so i'm still monitoring the windows uh, memory allocation here and uh, I'm creating 100 events. Uh, so I created the user event, I registered, I'm uh, adding the 100 events. And now I'm going to uh, enter in the while loop, but the uh, event structure is not handling my uh, data user event. So what is going to happen uh, to these uh, events in memory? And in the same time, I'm, go I, I'm going to continuously generate user events uh, uh, in parallel. So I'm raising the code. And yeah, as soon as the event structure uh, is executed, uh, the event not handled by the event structure are freed from memory, and I can continuously generate user events, but there is no uh, handler for, for them, so the memory uh, remain uh, to zero. There are no memory leaks uh, in this situation. The only memory leak you can have with events is that you are registering user event and your uh, event structure is not handling event fast enough. Uh, and so you are uh, basically 
having your event queue uh, growing uh, because you are not handling the event uh, uh, fast enough. Is there any question about the uh, memory management? The only question was from Zaba asking if we close the VI without unregistering and there are still unhandled messages, will the memory be released? To which we think the answer is yes. Yes, I would say too. But this is something you don't have. You don't have. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, if you are not on registering events, uh, it's uh, still in memory. But yeah, you have to uh, unregister uh, events when you finish uh, the 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 code uh, and and the call to the, the event structure. Yeah, I um, guess that probably the memory will be released when the VI leaves the memory, which I think too. And as he says, there's not a good control other than removing the VI from memory. But still, exactly. like what Olivier said. Uh, it's good practice to just clean up after you. Okay. Okay. Um, now I'm going to show you some uh, rules uh, to follow when you are using event structure and, and rules to to know. Uh, I think uh, first is uh, about registering events. So in green, in the left. This is the way you should do uh, every time. So if you want to handle events in two different event structure, you need to have one register event for each event structure. So you need to fork the wire, uh, the event wire, and not as you uh, the event register wire, as you can see on the um, on the right. Why I didn't put this in red? Because I think 99.9% .9 of the time you need to do this. If you are forking the event uh, registration ref num, you are not going. Uh, to know which event structure is going to handle event. Uh, the register event node is creating the queue. Here you are telling the code, you have one queue, but you have two different structures that are going to handle the event. So they are going to share the queue. So event are going to be handled randomly by one or another uh, event structure. It could be interesting if you want to optimize the thread usage uh, of uh, your VI. And obviously, uh, data contained in your event should be uh, uh, independent from other events. So yeah, it's not in red, but um, yeah, do it carefully if you need to, to do it. Uh, a second thing to know, it's the um, multiple uh, event structure in a while loop. This is in red. I'm strongly um, uh, asking you to not doing this because it's going to be a nightmare to, to use. So just remember that this is not to be done. Olivier, just a, yes. a comment or a question. Um, going back to the previous example, Mike asked that on the right hand side in the yellow case, if you can show it quickly once more. Yeah, in this one, uh, the question was if event handling cases will be in separate while loops, will they end up in separate parallel threads? Hmm. Good question. I don't know. I don't really know uh, 
But it would about... still be a problem, right? Because the, the, the problem itself would still be the same thing. So Fab asked to say out loud that the problem with forking the wire is that there is a case where both can handle it. So then one would starve the other one if we fork the event registration wire. So maybe maybe reiterate that um, that there can be a problem. Most times there yeah. will be a problem when you fork the event registration wire. Yes, but it could be sometime uh, interesting to use it carefully. Uh, and and this uh, this is something I discussed with uh, Craig Smith uh, from uh, NIRND. And uh, it didn't tell me that uh, you mustn't fork this wire, but you need to be aware that uh, it should be handled carefully, really carefully. Yeah. Okay. Good. Is it is it uh, is it okay? I think that should be the takeaway for everybody. If you fork the wire, that's really you have to know what you're doing and more <laughs> probably. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. This this is fine. Okay. There are no issue with this. Air. This is a, a great power, but uh, it's great responsibility too. Okay. If I may uh, <laughs> use these uh, words. <laughs> okay. Now let's dive into timeout events because. Sometimes uh, timeout events uh, is not really understood understand, uh, by, uh, by user. So what is the, uh, uh, the timeout event? This is, uh, and this is the, the default case you have when you drop the event structure in your diagram. So uh, we need to understand what is it. So uh, the timeout event is fired uh, as soon as you don't have any other uh, event uh, in handle uh, by the event structure fired during the uh, time you you set uh, in the timeout terminal. Um, here we can see in the example that uh, timeout events uh, are uh, executed uh, repeatedly. Now, if I'm uh, moving the slider, uh, you can see that the timeout uh, is not executing anymore because I'm handling the value change on the slider. So this is uh, the thing to know. Uh, the thing to know is that uh, you are, uh, you don't have to have a timeout uh, event uh, case uh, in your event structure. You, you, you can remove it and just handle the event you want. And if there is a timeout case, you need to uh, wire uh, value in the timeout terminal. This is uh, what we need to know about uh, timeout uh, events. But we need to go uh, further than that. And um, what we can do with the timeout event. And for, uh, I think, Probably for DQMH user, uh, it's something uh, really interesting to know because uh, you can add a uh, helper loop in your uh, DQMH module, and it's still relying on the on an event structure. And if you want an helper loop to uh, do something repeatedly, you are going to use the probably you are going to use the the, the timeout event. So uh, we can have some issue with, with this because uh, here in this example, I'm uh, generating, uh, I'm simulating uh, uh, repeated uh, reading um, action on an instrument. So it's working well. Uh, in my uh, first graph, I have the, 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 the data read. And uh, on the, the graph below, I'm plotting the, the time between uh, two uh, reads. But it's simulated, and I'm just um, uh, generating uh, a sine wave. 
But uh, to be uh, more uh, realistic, I need to add some delay, some random delay on the read action. So if I'm doing that, we can see that uh, the time elapsed between two reads uh, are not uh, is not the same. So I have the delay because the time out uh, is starting when uh, the event structure is uh, rich is rich again in the data flow. So uh, if I it took uh, 100 milliseconds to execute the timeout uh, case, uh, I'm going to add this to the 250 milliseconds I set uh, here. And uh, another issue I can have is that if my event structure is handling another event, like write action, if I'm doing this, I'm resetting the timeout. And if I'm doing the write action faster than the timeout uh, period, I'm completely stopping the read action. So this is not uh, going to work to have a, a steady uh, execution period. So how we can fix these issues? That's the point that is interesting. Here I have this example, the same example, but if I run it and if I add reading delay, I can see that the elapsed time between two reads is the same. If I'm writing and I'm writing fast, my reading is not stopped and everything is working fine. So, how we fix that? We just have to rectify the timeout period. So for the timeout uh, case, I'm just uh, keeping track of the time uh, the read operation uh, is taking to, uh, to, to get the, the data. And I'm subtracting it to the uh, actual uh, reading period I want. And for the right uh, action, the thing is, as for each timeout execution, I'm keeping track of the time the uh, case is uh, executing. And in the uh, writing uh, case, I'm just removing the, actu the, the current time to the la latest uh, time the timeout uh, case uh, has, uh, has been executed. And I'm removing from the, the actual period. So I can keep the reading period uh, steady and uh, equal. So this is uh, probably a really easy trick to implement, but it is something you need to have in mind when you use the timeout uh, uh, case to have a, a repeated uh, action um, uh, to, to, to make a repeated action, it's you, you need to have uh, in mind that the timeout could be uh, uh, prevented to execute as you uh, may uh, want uh, if you are not keeping uh, this uh, rectification code uh, in your code. So I hope it could help people to use timeouts. Even That's one question, Olivier. Yes. Uh, one question that I think would be good for you to answer. Benjamin is asking if this if this could be achieved with the wait for next um, multiple millise wait for next millisecond multiple VI. In 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 which in in which case you want to add the wait multiple uh, millisecond? I don't think. Uh, it could be uh, uh, used in this case. I don't see how you can. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, the short the short reply uh, for me it's no. Uh, you can uh, 
you can fix the, this issue with the weight multiple uh, millisecond. So I think the idea would be to make the timeout itself very small and then put the weight function in the timeout case hmm. so that you timeout immediately and then wait for the period there. But uh, Mike adds that if any handling takes then actually longer than the wait period, there will be some skewing yeah. in the phase. But that is a problem anyhow, I think, no matter what the mechanism here is. If whatever yeah. you do takes longer than a timeout, yeah. The, the difference probably is that if the reading uh, action is uh, taking more than 250 uh, uh, milliseconds, you are going to have the timeout uh, event, uh, the timeout to zero. So it's going to go faster to the, the next thread. If you are using the next multiple milliseconds, I think you are going to wait for the next multiple uh, milliseconds. This so is we would lose the one difference. iteration, right? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. okay. I think so. I, I, yeah, I, I, I use this trick many times. Uh, it's working fine. I, I didn't see any uh, caveats. And I, yeah, I, I wouldn't use the the next multiple, uh, the, the weight and next multiple milliseconds here. We can discuss okay. it uh, later uh, if you, uh, if it's uh, yeah. an interesting point. And uh, probably we, we we would need to to modify this example uh, this example uh, and use the the the, the weight next multiple milliseconds uh, node uh, and see what what is happening. Now, I, okay. I never tried it. Mm -hmm. uh, get back to the uh, user interface event. Uh, this is uh, something I really like. I, I, I like uh, uh, user interface and, and I like uh, uh, making a really advanced user interface. And this is something I I used uh, and I've been using uh, for uh, dynamic uh, user interface, I, I would say. You can register, uh, you need to know that you can register uh, event dynamically. Uh, when we uh, talk about user uh, interface uh, events, uh, we probably think uh, first that we need to add a new case to handle uh, uh, a key done uh, event or value change event. But we can also uh, register events dynamically. So you can uh, wire a reference uh, on the register event. You can select which event you want to handle. And here in this example, I'm um, going to I'm, I'm just going to, uh, to to make you the, the demo. So here I want to be able to uh, move controls uh, when I run the, the VI. So uh, how we are going to, to do that? We are um, at the beginning of the code, we are registering uh, all the uh, mouse down events uh, on all the controls we can find uh, in the UI. And then I'm also preparing an, uh, the event structure to handle the mouse move and the mouse up event on the pane. But as you can see, I'm just uh, wiring here a constant. So uh, events are not registered, but uh, we are uh, just uh, telling the event structure there could be uh, this event to handle. And now in the event structure, I can uh, uh, handle the mouse down uh, event. And when I have a mouse down event on one of the uh, control here, I'm registering the mouse move and the mouse up event on the pane. With this, I can uh, follow uh, the mouse uh, when I grab the control and change the position of, of the control. And when the mouse up 
event is fired, I'm just unregistering the mouse move and mouse up event. And uh, I don't have any event to handle here anymore. And the, 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 the really cool thing uh, uh, in this uh, VI is that I can duplicate the controls, run the VI, and it's working for all the duplicated events. So yeah, I like that. <laughs> And uh, it's really interesting to know this, uh, to uh, be able to, to make re uh, advanced uh, UI uh, interface, I think. Now, uh, the end of the, the presentation and the examples is more about uh, how to debug uh, an application that use uh, event uh, events in it. Um, first thing to know is that uh, LabVIEW is providing uh, the event inspector window. This is a tool uh, you can uh, find in the, the view menu. And uh, this is uh, something that allows you to monitor the event queue. So if I'm running uh, this VI or uh, this other VI, uh, the thing is that we can select which VI we want to and which queue we want to monitor. We have uh, a log. So here uh, we can see that uh, all these timeout events have been uh, handled. Uh, the unhandled event table is here to let you know that everything is going fine. You don't have any unhandled event here. If this table is growing, it's not good for you. <laughs> and uh, if I'm um, uh, looking at what the event inspector uh, window can uh, give us, I'm just moving uh, one control and I can see in the log that I have the mouse done uh, event on string to uh, handle, some mouse move on the pane, and one mouse up uh, on the pane. So I can see all the events I uh, described uh, to you uh, before in this, uh, in this window. So this is a, a, a great tool to know uh, if, you have, uh, if you need to inspect uh, what is happening with your events uh, in your code. And could, one thing, yeah, just one thing to know about this is that you can find uh, the VI uh, used to uh, create the event inspector window in the uh, LabVIEW resource dialog event inspector folder. And so you can build your own event inspector or yeah, get information on, on the event on this. And uh, just be careful, this is, are not public VI, so it can be modified or removed without notice uh, uh, by an eye. Uh, yes, your go ahead. There are yeah, questions. So I think that's kind of already answering it. Uh, Mike asked if there is a way to programmatically read the length of unhandled event skew. Yes, with, with the, 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 the VI uh, here, you, you can get the information. Exactly, thank you. You're welcome. And um, now, now we, we, we know that uh, we have the event inspector. Uh, what kind of shit situation uh, can be led to uh, what I call an overflowed event structure? So an event structure that has uh, events uh, unhandled. Uh, here I have an example where I have two um, sliders here, and I have one case uh, for each of these sliders with different options. And we are going to uh, look at the uh, latency uh, of the uh, event ending. So what is latency is uh, the measurement of uh, the difference between the time where the event is generated 
and the time where the structure event is handling the event. And I want to point out to you that we have a really useful uh, output here on the left of the structure. This is the time uh, output. And this is something I, I uh, learned uh, six months ago. So I, I, I'm using LabVIEW for 20 years now, and I still uh, learning things on events. So uh, yeah, it's, it's great to have this kind of uh, feature and, and th this kind of learning uh, when you, you are coding with LabVIEW. So this uh, output, is not uh, as I was thinking uh, before. It's not the time where the case is executing, but it's the time where the event uh, that is um, generating the execution of this case has been uh, fired, uh, has, has been generated. So if you are subtracting the current time to time, you have the latency. Uh, you can, uh, you, you are uh, uh, handling the event. So if I get back to the example, uh, we are uh, expecting to have the lowest latency uh, possible. So here we can see that for both uh, sliders, a value change event, I'm about zero latency, but I have nothing to do uh, in my uh, event case. So I'm going to add some delay here. And I'm going to see what is happening with the first slider. So the first slider, we can see that we still have the uh, zero latency, but the slider is not moving smoothly. We can see that we are missing some event. And on the second slider, I still have the smooth uh, way to move the slider, but we can see that the latency is uh, uh, growing. So I'm going to have to, I I'm, I'm unqueuing some events and I'm handling it with delay. So if you have this kind of situation in, in your UI, uh, the user, uh, is going to have a really uh, bad experience. Uh, so what's the difference with the two uh, sliders? The first one uh, has the um, lock panel option uh, enabled. This is the default value for this option. So as far as you have this option um, enabled, uh, LabVIEW uh, is going to defer any event uh, that could happen uh, until the case, the, the event case uh, completes. So you are not uh, adding events uh, in the queue. Uh, in the second uh, event, I disabled this function. So all the events, uh, are enqueued in the event queue. So uh, if it takes time to uh, handle each event, you are going to have the, the, the queue uh, growing. Uh, another option you can use here is uh, that you can limit the maximum instance of uh, this event in the queue. If you want to, to keep track of the 10 latest uh, instances of this event in your queue, you can um, define it uh, here. So yeah, be aware. Uh, be aware of uh, there are some controls. There are some events that are really prone to this kind of issue: uh, sliders, uh, mouse move events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The 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 all the events that that can all, all the events that can generate. Uh, all the controls that can generate lots of events when the user is uh, moving the, the mouse, uh, I would say. Olivier, another question came in. Yes. Um, Mike asks if uh, one can do the queue length limiting also for user events. Yes, that, 
Excellent question. We are going <laughs> to the next example. Thank you Perfect. for this question. <laughs> <laughs> this was not prepared. <laughs> we can flush events. So we saw in the uh, previous example uh, a way to statically, uh, statically um, uh, configure uh, the way the event queue is uh, 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 is uh, handling uh, the event that that come in in the queue, but we have this uh, function, the flush uh, function. So, uh, just to uh, a reminder, events uh, functions are in the dialog and user interface palette. I, that probably not the right place, but anyway. You need to know that and you can find the uh, flush event here. So this function is really powerful. It's a bit complicated to use, but it's really powerful. Uh, so speaking of user events and how to uh, handle a uh, overflow uh, user event. Uh, this is uh, uh, the usual example I have. Uh, so I I create a user event, I have a loop that generates data, and my main loop is handling the event. Uh, everything is uh, going fine. I'm, I can open the event inspector, and this is something to know. You can open the event inspector uh, directly uh, from the event structure, uh, right-clicking when uh, on it when the code is running, and you have the event inspector window uh, available here. And we can see that we don't have an handled event here. But uh, as usual, <laughs> I can add some delay uh, in the event, in the case that handled the event. And we are going to see that the unhandled event um, table is growing. So we have an issue here. I can enable the Flush, uh, I can remove the delay. And so you see that everything is going fine again. But if I add delay, I can also flush the overflowed event. And this is something really interesting because we can uh, select which type of event, which event we want to uh, to flush. So you can uh, register multiple events here. And it could be user event, it could be a user interface event, it could be any uh, kind of event in this flush uh, function. And you can tell this function to uh, flush one or more uh, type of uh, event here. And you can uh, tell hit that uh, you want to keep the n most recent event. Here, I'm just keeping the 10 most recent events. So you can see that my, uh, my data is not uh, really uh, good, but we know that this is the most recent data here. And we can also uh, tell uh, the flush function that we want to keep the uh, all the event time, uh, so we, we, we want to keep the here the uh, all the events that happen during the, the last second. So you can do a lot of things here, and I would say that the best thing to do is that your code uh, obviously needs to handle events correctly, but you can use the flush event to monitor uh, your code uh, execution. So. Uh, we can imagine that uh, in your code, um, a user is uh, modifying the setting or your computer is not working uh, uh, working fine and uh, the time processing is, is uh, bigger than usual. And you can uh, get the number of events discarded. So you can uh, monitor uh, if uh, there are some events um, older than one second or 500 milliseconds uh, not handled and warn the user that there is probably an issue uh, with, the, with the code. 
So that's really uh, an interesting and uh, uh, excellent uh, function to use uh, when you are dealing with uh, events. We have five minutes for the la latest example, and this is some. Uh, this is an example. I really, uh, I wasn't. Uh, I, yeah, I hesitated to 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 add this to my presentation, but this is something that happens really, really often when you uh, are discussing events with people. Uh, it comes that. We need to compare events with Q. Uh, and I don't want to be dogmatic. I really like events and I like Q also. I used uh, them when it's needed. But yeah, I, I just want to highlight the similarities and the differences uh, between Qs and events. So first thing uh, is similarities uh, with events. And with Q, you can have priority message. Uh, with Q, you have the on Q element at opposite opposite end, and with uh, the generate user event, you can um, tell uh, this function to uh, on Q with high priority. Uh, just be aware that there are uh, small differences between these two. Uh, when you are on, uh, generating user event with high priority. It's uh, just adding the event in top of the normal priority. So if you have two events with high priority generated, the second event will be less uh, will be uh, added after the first uh, high priority message. So yes, you and this is. Uh, this is in the documentation, but it's it's not that obvious uh, when you read uh, the documentation. Uh, as far for a non-native uh, English speaker, um, you can flush event and you can flush queue. This is the same, and with the uh, flush uh, event queue, uh, it could it it could be selective uh, depending of the event you want to flush. Now, talking about differences, there's no preview uh, event queue uh, element. That's something to know. There are no uh, uh, anything uh, that could be uh, identical to the named queue. So for those who don't know, you can um, create a queue with a name. If you are uh, coding the obtain queue with the same name, it's not going to uh, create a new uh, queue reference, but it's going to, to call the, the, the same uh, reference. But yeah, uh, it's breaking the data flow. Uh, it's like having a, a global, but this is something you can have with the queue and it could be interesting to, to, to use it sometimes. A big difference between queues and events is that events are one to many relationship and Q, queues are one to one. So if you have, if you create one user event and you register to many uh, different uh, user event structure uh, and you generate a user event, all the event structure are going to receive this, uh, this event. In the, uh, with the queue, you create the queue you have an NQ, you need to have a DQ, uh, and you can't have uh, multiple DQ. Well, you, you are not going to, to know uh, which uh, of the DQ uh, function is going to handle the, the event. So this is probably the, the, the biggest difference between Q, queues and events. Uh, another thing to know is that, and I showed you in the previous example, uh, if you create an event and generate user event, you are not going to have any memory leak as soon as you are not registering the, the event. Uh, with the queue, if you do the same, if you unqueue without dequeuing, you are going to have a memory leak. Uh, latest thing I wanted to know, to, to tell you, uh, is uh, it, it's about differences. Uh, 
one cool thing with events uh, is that with the same structure here, I can handle different type. And uh, I have a case for each of the uh, events with the uh, data uh, available in the, the left uh, output here. If I want to do the same uh, with the queues, uh, I need to create two different queues. This is possible. And if I want to handle the, um, the different data type in the same queue, I need to, to use the, the well-known uh, cluster uh, enum uh, and uh, variant or string with variant. Uh, so I can uh, know uh, when I dequeue uh, the element of the queue that uh, the queue contain a Boolean or string and I, I need to use the variant to data function and it's prone to the uh, 91 uh, error when you change the data type here. So this is something uh, different from the, the queue. But as I said, uh, use the queue when it's uh, good to use them and use events when it's good to, to use them. I'm done with this. I'm sorry, I'm a bit late. And the code is available on GitLab uh, at this uh, address. Uh, yeah, this is really easy. It's gitlab.com, Wovalab, and open dash source. And you have all the open source projects uh, Wovalab is uh, maintaining uh, available here. Yeah. Thank you all for your time and for your listening. Uh, I hope you learn things. Uh, and if you have any questions, I can reply it or we can, yes, just reach out to me and I would be pleased to, to talk about events again. Thank, thank you, Olivier. Um, there were no more questions in the chat, actually. We could handle a few things that came up. And uh, okay. <laughs> we'll be interested to see all the community contributions to your open source repository implementing all the variations yeah. etc if you want to add things uh, in these examples uh, yes feel free to to add them uh, i will be happy to to look at them thank you yeah, everyone and uh, thank you and uh, have a, a good end of uh, the summit three hours left for those that uh, didn't uh, uh, slipped uh, from the beginning thank you all